And we are live on Facebook. Welcome, everyone, to another New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. It's my great privilege and honor today to have Mr. Michael Zach with me today. Michael, thank you for joining us. Thanks, JR. It's an honor to be on your program. Now, he wrote a book that we're going to do a real deep dive analysis, as we have done with the Professor Schaff's book on Abraham Lincoln statesmanship and the limits of liberal democracy. Also talking uh, to Dr. Staber as we are, but now we're going to also include Mr. Michael Zach, who wrote uh, this book right here. It's called Back to Basics, Back to Basics for the Republican Party. Um, Michael, you wrote this book and what was the year that uh, you uh, uh, published this book? 2000 and in the third edition in 2003. And uh, I should say and, that uh, I did... this book. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I have given. Speeches... No, I was just going to say before. Go ahead. No, we're on a little lag. So go ahead, JR. Now, I was going to say before we get into the book, I'd like for you to just give us a little bit of a, a brief bio about yourself. Introduce sure. yourself to our audience. Well, thanks. I'm from Chicago. I was in the State Department and then I was in banking around the world. And then I realized, you know, that wasn't for me. My mission and my reason for the, for uh, my career at that point was to help the Republican Party. And it, it just occurred to me that I was watching Republican politicians and I realized they, number one, didn't know anything about the Republican Party as an institution, and two, didn't care. Mm. And I said to myself, you know, how can a salesman be effective if he doesn't care about his product or his company, or how can a diplomat be effective if she doesn't care about her country? Well, well put. I realize that well, Republicans are so ineffective because they don't care about their party as an or as an institution, not only nationally but historically, from the beginning through to today. And so I said, well, my mission here is to fill that gap, is to educate Republicans number one about their party, and number two why they should care about their party. And so then I wrote Back to Basics for the Republican Party. And uh, that's the title and it's, it, that's what I mean. And it's to examine what was the purpose in the mentality of the early founders of the party? What were they trying to do? And how is that relevant to today? And I realized the more I got into it, it's very relevant today. They were on fire to save this country from the Democratic Party. And what they were about and what they, what motivated them is precisely what Republicans should be about and what should motivate them today. That's an outstanding introduction, uh, Michael. And uh, you and I are kindred spirits because I created and founded this uh, group really based upon what you have uh, put forth in this, uh, in this extraordinary book, uh, Back to Basics. Uh, for the Republican Party, we'll also have a uh, link uh, with the recorded version of this show. Also, uh, talk to us about your blog before we get into the book. Very, uh, outstanding blog. Michael oh, Zach is a historian of the Republican Party, and he shares this information on a daily basis. So please tell us about uh, the Grand Old Partisan. Thank you. Yeah, the blog is called GrandOldPartisan.com. And what it is, is every single day of the year, it celebrates Republican heroes and heroics. And uh, sometimes it's monumental, like uh, the Emancipation Proclamation or Republicans um, freeing the slaves. Um, sometimes it's economic policy. Sometimes today, for instance, it's very fortuitous mm -hmm. that we have our program today. Today is the 20th anniversary of Clarence Thomas citing Back to basics for the Republican Party in a Supreme Court decision. So about that. Grand Ol yeah. So today's the day. So if you go to grandopartisan.com, uh, the top article there is today's article, and it's 2001. He cited it in a Supreme Court case. And as I mentioned in the article, uh, um, uh, it, a reporter called me and you know about it you know, long ago, and he I said, why did he why did Clarence Thomas cite the book? And he said, quote. He said, it's an air kiss to the book. So that's, you know, it's Clarence Thomas giving, blowing a kiss to back the basics for the Republican Party. 
And uh, I ran into him several years later at a, at a party and I mentioned it to him and he, and in the, 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 the book, and he just thought for half a second and he said the name of the court case. So he knew right away and he had a big smile. So we had a nice chat. So anyway, today's the day. And again, it's grand old partisan every single day celebrating Republican heroes and heroics. Sometimes it's a tremendous event. Sometimes it's just the birthday of somebody who deserves to be heralded. And, and, and let, me put this, let me put it this way. If Democrats had a heritage of achievement and honor like the Republican Party does, they would talk about it every single day. It would be the <laughs> point of the, the White House, point of the day in the media every every day that would lead the news. The Democratic Party has nothing to be proud of, or very little. That's right. And in contrast, so we're the good guys throughout history. And no yet question. from our party, it's silence, silence. Here's yesterday, yesterday's article, yesterday's article is about uh, the origin of the Republican elephant and the Democrat donkey. Not just yes. in general, but specifically a campaign poster that was published on that day. Interestingly enough- We have enough, it up on our NJCR yeah, page. Yeah, interestingly enough, the Democrat donkey has a name. No one knows that the Democrat donkey's name is Jeff for Jefferson Davis. Yeah. From the Republican leadership, silence. I, I hand them victory every day. Here, take it, yeah. win. Yeah. And you know, there's an old saying: you can, you can take, you can take Republicans to peanuts, or take elephants to peanuts, but you can't make them yeah. eat. So That's there right. you go, grand old. That's partisan a great doctor. analogy. That's right. And what I want to say too, uh, Michael, is the fact that what you're sharing on a daily basis, you're sharing Republicans, men and women that have, from the beginning of the party right up until the present day, each day, very interesting history that needs to be uh, studied and understood by all Republicans. We have a tremendous heritage. And I think and you're the only man who I know or the only resource that on a daily basis is giving us history about Republicans who were in Mississippi, the founders of the Republican Party in the Carolinas, um, the great men and women, black and white, um, who added to the rich history of our Republican Party. And the, this is very important that you do this work, and we're so supportive of it. Thank and you. And incidentally, I do, incidentally, I do want to say I really like your t-shirt. Ha. And I wanted to yeah, Abraham and I Lincoln. also kind of that's right. And I also Lincoln. wanted to, that's right. Well, he, he he can adjust to any, he'll he'll adjust to any genre, right? There Abraham Lincoln can adjust to any genre. That's right. Um, but but the, re the, the way I found out about you, Jack, was very, or uh, Michael, rather, talking about Jack Jefferson Davis and all that, yeah. so the jackass of the Democrats. Yeah, the jackass but anyway, Democrat. <laughs> right? the, the jackass, which I think was a reference to Andrew Jackson, was it? Oh, not? definitely, definitely, yeah. But I wanted to say that the reason that I found out about you, Michael, is uh, opposed to Rob, Bob Greco, who's a lo local Republican, former Cumberland County chair here in my county, and he had a book up on his shelf, and I looked at the book in the background. It wasn't the uh, topic of the post, but it had a picture of Abraham Lincoln, Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, and Ronald Reagan. And immediately, my eyes were, it was like a magnet. And I said, what is that book? <laughs> and uh, I started, and I never, and I've always been a, a great admirer of the Republican Party, a supporter of the Republican Party. Um, I turned it up another notch in 2017 in creating this group because I really believe that this party needs to go back to the party of Lincoln, which we're going to talk about in a second right away. And uh, this book aligns perfectly with the purpose of the New Jersey Constitution Republicans. So I'm looking forward to a long, uh, enduring relationship with you and one that will restore the initial principles of our party and teaching Republicans the great heritage that we have nothing to be ashamed of, but can be right. boastfully proud about. Correct, correct. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, you mentioned Thaddeus Stevens, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg's book, a uh, movie helped 
rehabilitate or bring Stevens to the fore, but my book is well before then. And I'd like to think That's that right. you know, Spielberg read it because uh, um, that was one of my heroes. She was a, Stevens Stevens is a great, great man. And yes, he was, uh, you know, history books are written by Democrats. So he was vilified in the reconstruction era and until very, very recently. Why? Because Democrats write, write the history books, Democrat, neo-conservative, neo-confederate, you know, lost, uh, lost, lost cause, cause kind of guys in the 1870s and 1880s. And then the Woodrow Wilson progressive types and then the, and the, uh, the, you know, crazy lefties of today. What do they have in common? Democrats. And they all write the history That's books right. then and now. So a guy like Daddy Stevens is one of the best, greatest Republicans who ever lived. Oh, I, um, I just want to say that he was one of the greatest Republicans who ever lived, and the Democrat part, Democratic Party slammed him into the dust reputation-wise when um, I said, this man should be in the cover of the book. And also, there's uh, Charles Sumner, who's a little better known. Yes. He's the guy who was beaten almost to death on the floor of the U.S. Senate by a Democrat congressman. Preston Brooks. Yeah, Preston for, Brooks. for speaking against... Uh, Against slavery, and of course, slavery. Uh, yeah, and of course, there's Lincoln and there's Reagan. Oh, by the way, on the back of the book, there's Reagan's uh, farewell message to the American people, 1994. So, anyway, go ahead, Jr. And that farewell message, uh, iconic and truly the greatest farewell message of any Republican president. Of course, Abraham Lincoln didn't have the opportunity to do that, oh. but Ronald Reagan gave us the greatest farewell message. Um, to the American people ever given. But let's get into the book, uh, Michael. Uh, we got a lot to go over. We're gonna go over the overview today and we're probably gonna do a couple of chapters per show the next few, because uh, we really wanna get into this book and I encourage you, you're gonna need to buy the book because you're gonna wanna look at everything else. We possibly can't cover everything in this book, but you're gonna wanna read everything in this book. It's a delight to read. Um, anybody can read it, high school students, elementary students, adults and you'll get a great education on our Republican party. Uh, but the overview, Michael, you start out right away saying um, the Republican party is indeed the party of Lincoln, but uh, what does the party of Lincoln actually mean? And uh, what should it mean? Right, well, um, I'll talk a little about the overview. Um, I wrote it first, I wrote it as a standalone piece, the overview. The overview is, I think 18 pages, I read it today again. I read that, I wrote mm -hmm. that as a standalone piece. Well, let me back up, I'll tell you this. Good. Before I began writing the book, I said to myself, I'm gonna summarize the book in one sentence, meaning the elevator pitch, or if someone read the book, how would they summarize it to someone else? That's always a good idea when you're preparing a presentation or anything. If someone heard it, what would yes. they say you had just said? Give you one sentence. So I said, what's that sentence? And it took me 10 days to write one sentence because I said, at first I said, well, this will take a, an hour. And then it took day after day. And I realized there's a purpose to this. Everything yes. is going to focus on this sentence. And what I did was I printed it out and put it above the computer. Everything is about this sentence. And the sentence is in the overview. And it's the only sentence in the book, which is in bold font, which is, quote, to this day, we Republicans owe our party's muddled message and inability to battle the Democrats effectively to our own ignorance about the Reconstruction era, period. Bingo. There you go. So Bingo. that is a summary of the book. The, the first four or five paragraphs is a summary of the book. The overview is a summary of the book and then the book itself. So it's, very, it's written very carefully to uh, uh, impart as much knowledge effectively as possible. So the overview, the overview is a summary, but again, it's, it's, it's a standalone piece as, as you can tell. So what I did was um, I asked myself, why do Republicans shy away from their history? Or I mean, let me put it this way. There is some no movement today to appreciate the history, some. But that's all because of back to basics of the Republican Party and books that were written mm -hmm. and modeled after or inspired after. 
when Back to right. Basics for the Republican came out, there was nothing, nothing at all about the Republican Party history in any way positive. So um, anyway, so I, re I said to myself, why is it the Republicans have such a bad rip? Why are they afraid of talking about their own story? And I realized it's because Democrat historians spun very badly the Civil War and post-Civil War period and tell it right. from the Democrat point of view. And I said, that, that, that's the point. You've right. got to explain to the people, to the American people, the, 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 the reconstruction era properly. And once yes. you see that, once you explain it properly, then disappears any notion that Democrats tell this lie of the party switching and so forth. There's two reasons right. they do that. One, the Democrats have nothing, very little to be proud of. So their spin is, well, we'll just grab the Republican history for ourselves. So yes. Second that's what is, they did. yeah. And what, well, let me put it this way. And second is, once you explain, because they, Democrat historians told the story of the post-Civil War era incorrectly, that gives rise to a sort of a party switching mentality. But if you look right. at the at the at the the Civil War and the Reconstruction era properly and truthfully, mm -hmm. there's no room whatsoever for any notion of party switching. It's a very smooth transition from 1854 to 2003. So that's the overview right. in 18 pages. I, I take you through that, and I do it again. Right. I say, I'm going to tell you the same story, but with more details. Right. And I want to, and we're going to go through what you've written in this overview. And one of the things that I want to read is, is precisely from the book. You say, quote, how can we hope to convince voters to place their confidence in us, the Republicans, when we lack confidence in our own heritage? We Republicans must embrace, quote, the GOP's original reform agenda that is what at once pro-free market and pro-constitutional rights. So there you have it. Most people don't understand. They can't articulate what our initial principles are. This is what NJCR has been talking about. And you encapsulate that. And I think that's a very important sense and a very important question, Mike, Michael, that you ask. And how can we hope to convince voters to place their confidence in the Republicans when we don't know our own heritage? Great that's question. Right. Thank you. Well, our heritage, and I explained it in the overview, is... After the, at the end of the Civil War, Lincoln is shot, our hero, yours and mine, and a Democrat mm -hmm. president, a Democrat becomes president. Not just any Democrat, yes. Yeah, not just any Democrat, but he was from the South and bitterly racist, hated Democrats, yes. hated, hated Blacks, hated them, despised them. Yes, he did. But was loyal to the Union. So Lincoln, mm -hmm. very foolishly, Put him on a ticket and some historians try to excuse it well he had no no no, no. it was his idea um thinking it would bind the nation with northern republicans southern democrat da, 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 da. but no one counted right. on him being killed and what michael, happened was yes sir michael can yeah. i interrupt you i want to i want to ask you a question about yeah uh, lincoln's decision wasn't wasn't there quite a bit of influence um from the new york Republicans, uh, a gentleman by the name of Boss Tweed, who may have suggested that the Lincoln should try to unify the Democrats, um, the pro-union Democrats by picking Andrew ja Jack, uh, Johnson. Wasn't that, wasn't he coerced or wasn't he pressured to make that decision? Because I find it hard to believe with Lincoln's brilliance he didn't, we know he didn't like Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was drunk on the, on the Senate floor one time. I believe we talk about that in the next chapter. Yeah. And he wasn't a particularly liked, he wasn't a particularly respected man. He did come from nothing and earn his way up uh, and work very hard to gain the position. But wasn't there more than just Lincoln making a decision? Wasn't it also the party bosses that were involved? Oh, yeah, in yeah, decision? yeah. It was party bosses, but Lincoln uh, with a word could have retained could have made it clear that he wanted Hannibal Hamlin on the ticket. Right. Uh, there was a movement to, hey, let's put this uh, pro pro U.S. government Southerner on the ticket, and you know, 
and it did bubble up and there were a lot of people from New York and other places who wanted that. Um, it was totally within Lincoln's power to stop that and he didn't. And uh, he had a couple of nice things to say about Johnson. So that was pretty much it. And, uh, you know, uh, until then, even much later, vice presidents had very little role of anything. So that right. was kind of not even considered uh, a possibility. What happens if this man becomes president? Um, so, well, anyway, when, when, when the, as soon as Appomattox stopped, the, the, you know, the, the, the point of view of historians shifts from the North to the South. And then it's, oh, these poor Southerners being oppressed by these, you know, evil Republican types. That's the spin. And, uh, People forget that what is called Reconstruction, thanks to Andrew Johnson, didn't even begin right. for two years until after Appomattox. Two years. Yes. And I mentioned it's the very book, important how point. Nazi Germany look if the if the Nazi state in power at the provincial level uh, until forty seven, and then after the what after the Allied mean? armies went home and said, "Oh, yeah, could you start to be nicer to the, your local people?" Abs absurd. Anyway, that's what happened to uh, the South. Uh, the, the Confederates were still in charge. I mean, let me say the Confederate slash Democrats were still in charge of the South. Andrew Johnson, he said, yeah, slavery has got to go. You know, he was clear about that. That's out and can happen. But other than that, I really couldn't care less what you guys do to your, to your people. And that's what happened to the United States. And it was only after the 19, 1866 midterms when um, the, the, the Republican party gained a two thirds majority in Congress that they were able to pass over Andrew Johnson's veto, the Reconstruction Act and say, all right, start over. All these neo-Confederate state governments, they're out. Neo-Confederate state militias, they're gone. We're gonna start over. But again, there was a two year gap and that was just a tremendous, tremendous tragedy and all Republicans who are trying to understand the development of the party from the 1850s until today have to realize, have to spotlight that, zoom in on it. That two-year gap was, was yes. cataclysmic for the United Devastating. States. Devastating. Devastating. And, that, and that, uh, all that information is right here in the summary. I, what I want to talk about now, Michael, is the, is the reason why the North fall. Why did the Republicans uh, fight? And this is yeah. also the lost cause has done a has done a real uh, whitewash on this, but we're going to bring back the reason, real reason they fought. And Lincoln talked about giving the last full measure of devotion, which is what the Union Army soldiers gave at right. Gettysburg, and also the fact that um, they believed that the last best hope on earth which is what the constitution made possible through the United States. Really what it was is they were fighting for really essentially, essentially the fulfillment of the self-evident truth that all men are created equal, that of natural rights, the unable God-given rights of life, liberty, and pursuit. They were actually fighting for these uh, principles because they were under attack from the Confederacy who had their own constitution and did not believe in the self-evident truth that all men are created equal. Right. But I want to quote what you said from Lincoln. And Lincoln said, quote, a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start and fair chance in the race of life. And I really believe he meant opportunity instead of chance, because yeah. we know that Lincoln was very much a Calvinist and very much a, uh, a believer in predestination. <laughs> but yeah. he also said the great task remaining before us which of course was going to be reconstruction where we were we're talking about now. And um, the great task before us was to apply those constitutional rights to free black Americans. So right. talk a little bit about that. Well, what you, what Lincoln just would said could be a uh, speech today. Those words that yes. could be delivered by a Republican leader today. He, it's the same thing. That's right. And, what the Democratic exactly. Party, the, let's say the villainy of the Democratic Party is a, is a constant throughout mm -hmm. the history of the country. That, that 
what's made America great is not only Republican achievements, but Republican efforts to thwart the Democrat or slow down the Democrat agenda, the socialist agenda. And um, well, let me talk about why they fought. It, it's pretty easy, I suppose, to talk, to say, well, you know, the Southerners are fighting for, you know, the rich Southerner. Again, first off, there were a lot of Southerners who did not were not Confederates. People, I got to remember that there were a hundred thousand whites who fought on the Union side in the South. Wow, yeah, right, and and also and also, Michael, I wanted to just say that the North was made up of volunteers. There are right. very, very few that are actually drafted. However, the Confederacy did have. A, not only, a, yeah, not only did they draft first, but they also uh, uh, and decreed that everybody in the army, in the rebel army for any period of time was drafted, conscripted for the duration. The uh, Union never did that. So Try. Uh, people have to remember that I would say a quarter of the Southern male population fought for the Union. And say, how could that possibly be? Well, the blacks, there were 200,000 of them and they fought in the Union Army. They were Southerners, don't they count? Sure they do. Right. So if you add the 200,000 Southern blacks to the 100,000 Southern whites, you're talking about a third to a, a quarter to a third of the Southern males fought for the United States government. That is totally missing from most uh, analyses of, of the Civil War. And likewise, there were a lot of Northern Democrats who were pretty much on the, on the Confederate side. Uh, New York City, for instance, was uh, heavily New Democrat. New Jersey, and, too. Uh, they had the, the New Jersey, yeah, and a lot of them, they were called copperheads. They were, just, you know, for the snake, yeah. and they were just basically, <laughs> you know, Democrat, uh, patriots in name only. You know, they were, they were basically on the Confederate side, a lot of Northerners. So it, you know the the Civil War was just as much Republicans versus Democrats as Northerners versus Southerners. The political angle is totally missing from most history books. But anyway, why did Northern men fight for thirty years? The South, the Southerners, most there were some Whigs, but basically Democratic Party was saying, "If you don't give us this, we'll secede. If you don't give us that, mm -hmm. we'll secede. If you don't let us dominate the federal government, then most." government jobs were held by Southerners. If you don't do the, everything we want, we'll secede, we'll secede. For 30 years, they played that game. And the mm -hmm. Northerners gave them pretty much everything they wanted. In 1860, Republicans drew a line. No, there will be no slavery in the territories. That's it. That's right. We are drawing a line in the sand. And they didn't say we're going to abolish slavery tomorrow, but yeah, it was down the line. Clearly, that would have happened. And they said, there's going to be no slavery in the territories. That's it. And that was in the Republican Party platform. And Lincoln is elected. Well, Democrats don't like that. So they, they tried to secede. And we not only tried to secede, but fired cannons at a U.S. government fort at the, US, at the American something? flag. The uh, 30 years that Democrats have been, Southern Democrats have been saying, if you don't give us everything we want, we're going to secede. Well, then they, what did they do? They, they tried to destroy the country. And the Republicans were like, that's it. We're going to finish this right now. Because it's also a misunderstanding of, of history to notion that, that there was any way that the country could have split. Nobody, uh, nobody accepted that. That would have been a, just a temporary thing. Where would the border have been? Who got Kentucky? What about slaves escape? Or who got Maryland? Who gets Missouri? Who gets Arizona? Uh, what about free passage in the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers? What about slaves escaped the tort? Endless, endless fights would have happened. Endless wars would have happened. Everybody knew that. And especially in the North, that's why you had this, this tremendous outpouring of patriotism. Enough is enough. We are, there is no way that this country is gonna split. It's either gonna be all slave or all free and we're gonna to fight to mm -hmm. make it all free. Right. It's also too interesting uh, to note, Michael, as we uh, take on the lost causers and the neo-Confederates of today, mm -hmm. that it was the Southern states and all of their declarations of secession that made slavery 
the top priority in preserving and also in wanting to expand. Yep. And that a lot of people don't understand is, is that a lot of the, sl the slave power and those who believed in the slave power were offended when they told Northern uh, Yankees and the Union and Abraham Lincoln that uh, slavery is a good thing. It's a positive good, as Alexander Stevens said. Yeah. They were offended by the fact that the Union didn't agree with that. And that's why Lincoln talked about right makes might in his great Cooper Union speech. He was referring to the fact that the South not only wanted to expand and preserve slavery, they wanted us to believe it was a good thing. And people and don't also, realize that. Yeah, and they also wanted a federal slave code. They wanted a federal law, federal slavery for the whole country. So this whole notion again, it's it's it's, it's a it's these are Democrat historians who infected the nation mentality with this notion that that they were for the right of states. Confederates didn't give a darn about the states, the right of a state. They wanted a federal slave code that yes. you could not prevent slavery in Akron, Ohio, or Minneapolis, Minnesota. They wanted that. And Republicans said, that's it. We've, give, we've given enough. We've given up to you guys for 30 years. This is it. Yeah. It's go time. And that's why, again, you had a tremendous outpouring of patriotism of, of, of people after uh, Fort Sumter. Let me share another portion of the book I think is very important for the audience to, uh, to uh, contemplate. And you're going to want to go out and get this book. Um, we're just doing a, uh, we're <laughs> doing a soft review. There it is, Back to Basics of the Republican Party. But this is what uh, Michael Zach writes in the overview, which is what we're doing, a, an analy we're analyzing now. Uh, he says, quote, the common perception that Democrats are somehow less respectful of the Constitution that they often delight in stretching and twisting it to suit their purposes is valid. The misty origins of the Democratic Party lie, as we shall see in the movement to oppose ratification of the Constitution, while most people who advocated ratification formed the Federalist Party, ancestor of our Republican Party. Democrats spent decades before and after the Civil War yammering, I love that word, Michael, yammering about states' rights, a doctrine they invented to preserve slavery and use later to defend racial discrimination. In contrast, in contrast, the theme of the first Republican administration was Lincoln's struggle to, quote, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Republican Party is founded and based upon preserving the Constitution of the United States. That's exactly right. The Republican Party exists to, to defend the United States Constitution. And like I said, remember, I wrote this 20 years ago. And it's like, wow, I could have written this yesterday. It's the same <laughs> old, same. It's like, well, it's not that I'm this great visionary. It's just that the same old, same old from the Democrats and the Republicans for more than 16 decades. It's the same story, That's, different actors. But That's right. yeah, the Republican, what, I, I, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I'll explain later, what was the motivation for the founders of the party in the 1850s? What were they, what were they found? Their motivation was to preserve the United States Constitution to, and to protect mm -hmm. this country from Democrats who were just out for power. I mean, what is slavery? Yes, it's racist and bad, true. But what is it at core? It's, it's a way of empowering an elite by oppressing an underclass. Mm -hmm. And we can see modern versions of that today. And right. uh, the bad is- And Michael? Stephen, yeah. Yeah, let, let me, while you're there at that point, let me read what you, what you say here. Quote, the slave system, required a vast regulatory and enforcement infrastructure to keep people in chain for the benefit of others, just as the socialist policies of the Democratic Party today. An underclass today maintains the political and economic power of the Democratic Party elite and those in their employ, and those in their employ, if indirectly in the government bureaucracy, no underclass would mean no immense bureaucracy to run the welfare state established 
by LBJ and his great society and that administration, which we'll talk about later. But yeah. the same underclass, the same right. underclass has been preserved by the Democratic Party it's today. The same, it's the same scam. They take it, they grind a, a group of people into dust and use mm -hmm. that as their way of empowering an elite. And uh, we can just see uh, ways that's being done today. So again, the Republican Party, what they were founded for, why they came together was to pre preserve this country, preserve the rule of law, preserve an opportunity society, and preserve the US Constitution. And the Democrats, we've always been against that, all of it. It's just about mm -hmm. power for them, power of an elite over uh, an oppressed minority. And also, let me say this, in the, the post, in the, the, the Democrat run South before, during, and after the Civil War, immediately after the Civil War, it wasn't just the, the black slaves that were oppressed. It was the poor yeah. whites who were oppressed. That's right. Several ways. One, I explain this in the book, they could be oppressed and ground and down no matter what, because with the consolation that no matter what, hey, it's at least you're not a black, at least you're not a slave, or at least you're not later on, you're not a sharecropper. So, you know, deflection. So, so deal with it. And and uh, and you'll find that a lot of the, the, the hyper racist Ku Klux Klan types were the lower white class that, that were threatened by blacks not being oppressed anymore. It was an economic mm -hmm. battle. And, right. um, yeah, the, the, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We can get that later. But anyway, um, the, the, the scam of oppressing people and, and um, getting them to, one, tolerate the oppression of others, and two, uh, tolerate themselves being oppressed with the consolation that, well, at least I'm not oppressed even more like those other people. That's the same old scam the Democrats have been doing since, you know, since whenever. So I right. said to myself, I'm going to write the history of the party from the a history of the Republican Party from the Republican point of view, and get it right yes. and talk about that two year gap between uh, yeah between the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction, and if you right. understand that, you'll understand why Republicans have always been sort of off balance ever since because we we right. enabled the Democratic Party to preserve this scam of uh, of empowering an elite by crushing. A minority, and it doesn't have to be a racial minority. It's any group of people that can be crushed in order right. to uh, empower themselves. Right. This is why the information uh, in this book is so important for all Republicans to get out and purchase and read. And another portion I want to read, uh, uh, Michael, as we move through, uh, sure. I want to swiftly move through some. I've got quite a few uh, uh, portions of the book I want to go over, but here's another one. Quote. Republicans met little opposition in enacting their progressive economic agenda, a national banking system, a national currency, free land for farmers in the Plain States, land grant colleges, and the transcontinental railroad and other structural reforms that brought forth the industrialization that soon made the United States the wealthiest country in the world. And of right. course, the Republicans right. were able to do this because the Democrats pulled out of the Congress and Lincoln, a true Madisonian, believed that the Congress was really the driver and he was the enforcer of the laws that the Congress would come up would uh, would, would initiate, being uh, their exclusive responsibility in creating law. And he had his hands full, of course, being the commander in chief of the war, which he managed extraordinarily well, considering the uh, ineptness of his generals. But Let's talk about the progressive economic agenda, which really came from the Whigs idea of the American system, correct? Yeah, correct. You know, um, the, uh, sometimes you'll see historians, they'll say, isn't it ironic that amid the Civil War, the government was able to enact all these wonderful uh, advancements in economic policy and strengthen the economy and so forth. Isn't it odd? Hmm. Not odd at all, like you just said. And like I mentioned in the book, it's all because most Democrats in Congress went with the Confederacy. 
mm -hmm. leaving the Republicans with this big majority and they could do pretty much whatever they wanted. And, and they got they, a lot done. They got a lot done. Democrats had opposed the, the transcontinental railroad. How could you be against a trans? They wanted it along the Southern route so you could have slave plantations all the way yes. to California. That's what the Democrats wanted. That's right. The, the Republicans passed the Homestead Act, which, which uh, gave uh, farms really? to the Midwest, you know, tremendous progress. Why didn't that happen before? Because the Democrats wanted slave plantations in Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas and all That's of right. it. That's what they wanted. And the and the and and once they were out of Congress or left most of them left Congress, the Republicans could pass all these things. The National Banking Act. There'd never been, yeah, there would be banking in the United States, but the, not quite the same. Before then, you had a multitude of um, small little, by the way. My blog, Randall Parson, the other day talks about the. You've heard the first national bank of this, first national bank of that. Yeah. The very first, yeah, first right. national bank. Yes, it actually happened, and I talked about that in the blog about a week ago. Well, that's right. Before right. the Republicans National Banking Act, you had little, every little bank, every there were no branch banks, so every little town had a bank, and they would print their own money, and say this is yeah. worth ten dollars, and here. And maybe you take it and you take it in the town and maybe the next town over and sort of kind of the county, but you were going to take money from some Ohio, but you had no idea what this was. So there the was right. no, it, it was a vast, uh, it was a huge um, uh, um, obstacle to national commerce. And the Republicans, when they took over the Congress, well, once they were handed power in the Congress, all right, we're going to have a national bank, nationally backed banks printing nationally backed money that is accepted anywhere. and you don't have to be you know you can be a freshman in eco economics major and you realize wow that's a that's a lot better well that's what the republicans did democrats that's didn't right. want banks they wanted like in wow. the south they didn't even want banks they tolerated why wouldn't you want banks because they right. wanted people to be serfs they wanted to, to mm -hmm. pay them like a plantation owner or a big factory worker, that owner would pay his workers on, on the books. You Oh, here you get $20 credit on the company books. And then you go to the company store and you draw down you know, $20. Well, the point is, if they do it that way, you're stuck. You can't go anywhere. You are dependent right. on- No mobilization. Well, yeah, it's your serfs, no mobility. Slightly Economic mobility. better off than slaves. And the Republicans said, no, 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 we're going to have banking. You can take your money anywhere. You can do anything you want with it. That was that's Republicans right. did that. So because I don't know, the Smithsonian Institution, the Democrats didn't mm -hmm. want that. You could go on and on and on and on and on. And when the Repub right. the Democrats took themselves out of the majority and Republicans passed all these things, it was great. We could just a little right. fantasy of what the country would have been like had the the Democrats at Pelosi not been able to obstruct or any Democrat majority the Republican agenda today. So wow, well that's what we had in eighteen sixty. Go ahead. That's exactly that's exact, great, uh, great uh, flushing that out, uh, Michael. I want to move on. I want to talk about the fact that those two years that you really uh, drive home as being very important. It got so bad after those four two years that the Republicans, the radical Republicans, feared uh, a regeneration or the restoration of the slave system in the South, and this provided the impetus for the for the third. Well, the Thirteenth Amendment came in. 1865 in December, but the 14th Amendment really became an impetus to make sure that the states had to respect the constitutional right to the freed slaves and then giving those freed slaves the right to vote to give them a political power. And that's, right. uh, that, that's what drove those amendments. People don't realize, oh, well, they just came up with these amendments and they were great amendments, but they were motivated to get these amendments through because Andrew Johnson uh, empowered the Confederacy. Again, the, the, those who went and fought for the Confederacy were back in the state governments in the Southern states. And also the fact that I think it's an amazing um, that uh, Andrew Johnson, and I didn't know this, actually put up, uh, contributed $20,000 uh, to defeat the ratification of the 14th Amendment. Yeah, Remarkable. Big, big money in those days, big money. It's so right, as it was uh well the 14th uh, the 13th amendment we're all familiar with that and um um it was eventually ratified in fact i wish that the ratification of the 13th amendment should be a, should have been a national holiday 
but the reason it isn't is because it's so pro Republican. Yes. But that's another, yeah, yeah. That's the ratification of the 13th be. Amendment should be a national holiday. But anyway, yeah. uh, the 14th Amendment, the per, the, what that was, was when, when the Republicans took power or took office, one of the first things they did was they passed the um, Civil Rights Act of 1866. Right. And that, again, said African American, well, it said everybody. So it said everyone has, it has their civil rights and due process and so forth and so on. And that was just a law. It was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And Republicans were worried, well, uh oh, what if we lose majority and the Democrats would just repeal it? Well, so with the 14th Amendment is basically the 1866 Civil Rights Act enshrined into the Constitution. That's what the 14th Amendment yes. is, totally written by Republicans. Yes. And not only, yep. there's a few points in there. It's like, as you said, we were so worried about the Democrats rebelling again the people forget there was other parts of the 14th amendment um forbidding uh, uh creating the use of honoring a, create, any creating, confederate money yeah I, it's a, and also citizenship it, yeah citizenship it said for instance that the that southern states are 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 banned from honoring confederate debts believe it or not yeah they were going to pay back rebel debts to themselves by taxing people. It was ridiculous. And, and honoring some notion of honoring f Confederate money and Republicans right. said, that's out. And also Democrats are also threatening to, to um, disavow the, the union, the, the US government debt that had been incurred to put down the rebellion. And so right. the 14th Amendment actually enshrines that debt as well. So it cannot be questioned. So anyway, but basically, yes, what we know mostly about the 14th Amendment was enshrining into the Constitution, the GOP's 1866 Civil Rights Act. Excellent. We're, uh, we're winding down. Michael, I think we're going to maybe have to carry on this uh, overview <laughs> into the next show. But I, I do want to touch on three different points. Number one, yeah. this is from the book. This is a quote from uh, Michael Zach. Our Republican Party was forced off its original course. Now you may appreciate that most social problems today are due to the lamely inadequate resolution of the central conflict in our history. Similarity, we are burdened by ignorance of our past with the mistaken impression that now and in the future, we have but a limited set of policy options to deal with these problems. And that's precisely where we are today with the Republican Party, right? Right, absolutely. We're, uh, we let the Democrats control the narrative, of course, and um, box us in to just certain uh, choices that we think that we can only do. We can pick socialism A or socialism B, and then we just don't think, well, there's a, there's a C. So, mm -hmm. We Republicans, again, would benefit tremendously by feeling, as I explained in the book, a kinship with Republican heroes of the past. And let me say this, Democrat historians also love Abraham Lincoln, got his shirt, but mm -hmm. to, an, to an extent they overemphasize Lincoln to put him above politics, like he had mm -hmm. wafted down, drifted down from the clouds to save the union. Mm -hmm. They do that, in order to remove him from his proper context as a Republican. Mm. What I do in the book is I give very great credit to Republican congressional leaders, such as these guys. Yes. And Daddy and, Stevens, and Charles Daddy Sumner. Stevens and Charles Sumner and a whole Calvin bunch of others. Chase. Henry Wilson. These men, Henry again, Wilson. were on fire to save this country from the Democratic Party. So I talk about that. And as you made a good point, presidents then didn't consider themselves until the, till really FDR, FDR consider themselves like king or, or leader. Their job was manager of the federal government. Yes, wartime Lincoln had to make some hard calls and focus, but he really focused on that. He, I've read dozens and dozens of biographies of Lincoln. He didn't spend a whole lot of time worrying about the Transcontinental Railroad, the National Bank Act. That was Congress. He said, yeah, great idea. Yeah. I'm for it. I'll sign it. But yeah. he had other things to do. Congress ran the show. And right. um, 
so putting Lincoln in his proper context as a Republican benefits the Republican Party and hurts the Democrats. Great point. We like to remove him. Right. Like, oh, Lincoln wasn't really Republican. And also another thing, Democrat historians vastly over overstate any sort of policy divide between Lincoln and the radical Republicans. Like it was Lincoln versus these evil Republic, radical right. Republicans. What were they radical and, about? And they were wasn't. radically against the slavery. I mean, who could not yes. have been? Well, Democrats, obviously. Lincoln palled around with the quote radical Republicans. Uh, you know, socially, they they were all on the same team. They the Democrat historians overemphasize these differences because yes, there are lots of instances of policy of arguments and conversations and disputes between Lincoln and the radicals. Very true, but the deafening silence or the overlooked questions. Lincoln didn't even talk to Democrats. This was all inter intra party squabbling. Yes. They were, all the same, they were all on the same team. Lincoln didn't give the time of day to the Democrats in Congress. Couldn't, right. honestly, you couldn't add up in two, the fingers of two hands the, the number of substantive conversations he had with Democrats in Congress. They just didn't count. It was all within the party. And, uh, you know, Lincoln could go at it with Thaddeus Stevens on this and this, and then they would go to dinner or, or, or Charles Sumner, who was, again, a big, they were trying to, they were pulling Lincoln along and obviously Lincoln couldn't go too fast because he had to run the war, but then they yep. would go to the theater to, or, you know, or the or picnic or something or carriage rides. They were all on the same team. So we have to right. put Lincoln in this proper context as a Republican. Once you put things all in the proper context, again, this history of the party is very smooth from 1854 yes. to today. There's no switching. There's no, there's no big fights. Um, the fight is, the, is the Republican Party trying to defend the Constitution and the Opportunity Society from the Demo from the slavery party, the Democrats? That's the big fight right. throughout history. Excellent point, uh, Michael. I want to touch on two topics. Number one, and this I thought was fascinating, is the influence that novels had in restoring this or uh, trying to restore this neo-Confederacy, this lost cause movement. One of them was a novel, The Klansman, a historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan in 1905. And then the subsequent movie that we've seen, the black and white movie, uh, 1915, The Birth of a Nation that Woodrow Wilson uh, revered. Um, said, quote, uh, it was terribly true, like writing history with lightning. This movie had a tremendous impact on the popular consciousness that spawned the modern day Ku Klux Klan. And this is what I find truly remarkable because as a young person born in 1962, my parents revered and that generation revered the movie called Gone with the Wind. They, everyone thought that was the most, the greatest movie, the most epic of all movie, and it painted the Republican Party, the Yankees, the North, the Unionists, the followers of Abraham Lincoln, the radical Republicans as being the enemies and making the Confederacy out to be the good guy. And yeah. that movie had an indelible influence on the psyche of our nation. It wasn't just the movie, it was the book, the novel Gone with the Wind. So, right. Seller, uh, you know, in term, I don't know how you define it, but one of the biggest selling books in American history when people read books, you know, they were cultural shaping sensations, not just, oh, yeah, I kind of remember that book or the movie. No, back in the day, they were as big as an, an influence on the country as the internet is today. Everybody knew and read that book and it, or those books, and everybody saw that movie. And they really did. Yeah. You know, Birth of a Nation, uh, the, oh, by the way, the Klansman, the book, was written by Woodrow Wilson's college pal. They were buddies from from Princeton, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, so he had, Wilson had a real soft spot for that because and you know premiered it in the, in the White House and all. So yeah, the Klansman was turned into a Birth of a Nation. Think of that, Birth of a Nation. What is what is that? Mm. You know the phrase. Terrible. It's, it's just it's just hideous. And yeah, the birth it, contrad it, it, it contradicts the rebirth of freedom that uh, Lincoln exactly. talked about in the Gettysburg. So it's completely it's the totally opposite. Totally contradicts. And the yes. villain of the villain of Gone with the Wind, uh, the the villain of Birth of a Nation is is Thaddeus Stevens. His name is Stoneman. Yes. And yo, know, by the way, yeah. Thaddeus Stevens' wife was he was majority leader basically. His wife was black, 
people nowadays you see the movie you know notice that but uh yeah the the not the the villain of of the clansman and the villain of gone of back of birth of a nation is thaddeus stevens one of the greatest americans who ever lived so right there there he is and uh gone with the wind the movie cinematically great you know i've seen it 10 times but the movie actually tones down the politics from the book the book goes mm -hmm. on which i've read once goes on and on and on and on about how awful republicans are and how great society was before before the civil before emancipation uh, lincoln emancipation when the blacks knew their place and everything was genteel and you know it's absurd and um uh so what we see in the movie is actually toned down quite a bit. The po most of the politics is gone. And the Klan is very much the heroes of the book. I don't think in the movie they actually mention the Klan, but they, they take that out. But in the book, which everybody read back in the day, uh, the Klan is the hero. And that yeah. both of those, since the books and movies really stopped the Republican Party in its tracks because... Uh, uh, they totally rewrote in the popular um, mind uh, the story of the post civil war, the pre and post civil and post civil war era. That somehow the Democrats were the good guys, and it's just absurd. And it was, it's really, I mean, it was, it wasn't just that, but um, those the impacts of those two movies and books can't be overstated. That's right. And the last uh, point I want to make uh, before we uh, end the show today, uh, Michael, is uh, what you read uh, on page seven, which says, quote, from the very beginning of our party, that's the Republican Party, there was a difference of opinion on how to oppose slavery. The most conservative Republicans merely wanted, and this would, this would uh, identify with Lincoln's position, Hello? merely wanted slavery continued uh, hoping that one day the institution would die out on its own. That was before the war began. He he changed as the war went on and became more of a radical Republican. Other Republicans went further, calling for some moderate and anti-slavery measures, which being careful not to upset the Democrats too much, but those with the most radical position were the abolitionists. They were the radical Republicans. And I love these questions that you ask here. Here are the questions. If you had been alive then, and this is what I want the audience to ask themselves. If you would have been alive then, would you have taken a conservative stance against slavery? Or would you have been only moderately against slavery? Or would you have been radically against slavery? Would, not, would you not have wanted the slaves set free immediately? And after the war, would you not have wanted to end forever the power of the former slave masters over their former slaves? If you answered yes, you are indeed would be considered a radical Republican. And that's what constitutional Republicans are. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know, I read the book. Great questions. Yeah, thank you. I read the book occasionally and it's like, Damn, I wrote that. <laughs> I'm really proud of it. <laughs> like it's it's just smokes, you know, and uh, and it could be. That's been, great, Michael. And it could have been written yesterday, you know. It's very timely, and uh, I am very proud of it. And uh, again, today is the anniversary of uh, Clarence Thomas citing Justice it for no Thomas. reason in the Supreme Court case for no reason at all, other than to give it a give it an attaboy. Now there's the book. Um, there it is on uh, Amazon, which we're going to post the link to. Very affordable. It's the best $16.95 you're ever going to spend uh, if you're a Republican. Uh, it says they've only got 17 in stock, Mike. So I hope the no, publisher's getting ready to. There's, more, there's, more, there's yeah. more on the way. There's more on the way. I hope that I I hope the publisher's going to speed up, step it up because uh, <laughs> we're going to be. Uh, not only talking about this book, but promoting this book uh, far and wide. Um, and the last question I wanted to ask you, Michael, um, is why don't you think that the Republican Party, after this book came out uh, in 2003, why don't you think it was more, it was embraced more and uh, and shared more amongst Republicans? What, what yeah. are your thoughts on that? Well, that's kind of sad. Well, first off, I should say, I, it did, is. Give, I did give, yeah, it's very sad, tragic. 
I did give speeches in 37, 31 states around the country, even Alaska, but at this very, you know, individual state party chairman or county whatevers would invite me. You know, I've been to uh, Cape May, New Jersey once, um, Florida, so county. 31 states. So I, it wasn't the total ignoring, but yeah, nation, I got no media coverage whatsoever. Um, it did cause a flurry of pundits quoting it and side next toward lifting from <laughs> awful uh lifting from it for their own articles and so forth so i guess that's a positive but yeah i got no media at all for it and nation nationally the party even today i i don't know i you know i, I blog about, there's a thousand conservative pundits this that blah 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 there's only one republican party historian writing about the history of the party that that's me there's only one and uh, it's a terrific resource, and I, it's just like pulling teeth to get Republican leaders to embrace it. Uh, nobody's at fault. Nobody's a villain. It's just that, you know, it's it's day to day. The Democrats just have this endless assault against the country. Yeah, and it's hard to to ignore that. And I I sympathize every day. There's something, and. Um, yeah. And so what my point, my, what I'm trying to, my approach is trying to just say, hey, let's just step back a little bit and mm -hmm. look at the big picture and, and re-energize and refocus on what really matters. And then we're equipped with this knowledge, we can go forward and win. Well, now yes. is like a terrific time for that right now in midterms, yes. quite a ways away. And everybody's shell-shocked at how awful the Biden administration is. And people say, well, what can we do? Well, number one, here's a nice unifying message. And, you know, I like to joke that, you know, if I were a high price consultant, someone would have paid me a million dollars to do this. And I, I'm doing, it's for free. It's like, here, take it. And uh, yeah. like I said before, you know, the old saying, you can lead an elephant to peanuts, but you can't make them eat. So again, nobody's yeah. a villain. Nobody's at fault. It's just, it, it's a right. situation where uh, the Democrats have such a sledgehammer of attack against the GOP. Yes. I mean, they own the media and they own everything basically. That it's hard for Republicans to say, hey, let's just step up back a bit. But you and I are on the same page and uh, that now is the time for that. And it's a unifying message as well. You know, the, the different right. branches of the party, which are kind of in shards broken right now, can all unify around, the, around that the Republican party should what? Get back to basics. I mean, who can be against that? So, but not exactly just the right. theme, but the, the, to, as I like to say, we should, consider ourselves in a kinship with Republican heroes of the past. Not just that. Yes. We can consider ourselves the it's not just oh then and now. We should consider ourselves we're the we're in the latest chapter of a saga. Yeah. A saga of the saga since 1854 and really be before that. We're just the latest chapter in this. And we're going to write the next chapter. So if we thought of ourselves right. as a party that way, it would be a tremendous advantage for team good guys, which is the GOP. Good question. Uh, Michael, we're gonna do everything the New Jersey Constitution Republicans, which of course uh, you are a part of. We're gonna do everything we can to get this book in the hands of as many Republicans as possible. We're gonna have more shows with you. We'll do another one uh, in uh, July with you. And I think I wanna finish up on the overview because we only got halfway through it. And yeah. then we'll move into the Then we'll move into the next chapters. But I do want to say that it, I think it would be very interesting if you had written this book maybe six or seven, five or six, seven years earlier, if one gentleman, one great congressman by the name of Jack Kemp, oh, maybe if seen this I book. Jack Kemp. That's right. He, he would have he identified, met. he would have been a big supporter of this book, and I'm sure he would have pushed it. I'll tell you, I, I, I met Jack Kemp several times, in fact. I volunteered for him when he was Great with man. Power America a million years ago. The last time I saw him, I talked about this, and he had read the book, and I pray, and he was praising it, but not on camera, yeah. not and in print yeah. to me personally. Right. Like that mattered. Yeah, you know? we needed a camera shot, a cameo. And then, yeah, like thanks, Jack. But but anyway, and I and I gave him the little lament, like, oh. Why can't you know? Is my message not getting through? Or why can't? Why is not the powers be? And I just got a little there, there. <laughs> a yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So it would have been nice to have more. You no, know, yeah, that would have been great. But um, but you know, let me uh, uh, point this out. I can't believe I wrote this book, didn't I? I'm so proud. Yeah, you what did. Is you the, did good. What Michael. is the speaking of what we were just saying? What is the 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 front piece of the book? The very first quote. It just quote the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The yes. second best time is today. That's, That's in the right. book. That's page one of the yep. book. So again, yep. it would have been nice 20 well, we're years ago. We're doing that now. Yeah, the second best time. We've got a new tree. Today. We've got a new tree we planted today. Thank you, Jr. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Twenty years. I hadn't thought of it until right now, and here it is, twenty years later. So yeah, the second best time is today. So Republican, today. learn your history. Learn your. I, I don't. I prefer the word heritage. Republicans, yes. learn your heritage. Appreciate yes. your heritage. Use That's your right. heritage, and think of this. Know it. Like I said before, if the Democrats had this heritage of achievement, they would talk about it nonstop. Right. We're right. the good guys. We have all this heroism, not just on civil right. rights, by the way. I talk about economic, right. e economic policy right. and everything else in this book. But we're the good guys throughout American history. And yet from us, except for me and now you, silence, silence. Yeah. And it almost I makes share. you want to cry. <laughs> Michael, share with share share with the audience what you say at the end of your videos that uh, people are going to be watching on the uh, Grand Old. Oh Person. right, okay. every day. What is I also, it you yeah. say about our history? I, I know what, what you're going to say. You say. Yeah, I get it. Um, I also do a the YouTube version of the Back to the Grand Old Partisan every day of the year. Also, I do a YouTube yep. version of the same article, and I always yep. end with the more we Republicans know about the history of our party the more the Democrats will worry about the future of theirs. Outstanding. That is a great quote and very applicable and a, the best way we could possibly end this first interview with you, uh, Michael Zach. Um, you're going to want to go out and order this book so that you can keep along um, with the future discussions and conversations we're going to have with Mr. Michael Zach. There's the pictures, the four of the greatest Republicans ever. And uh, it's been a great first interview, Mike, Michael. And uh, I want to uh, look forward to next month. And thank you for joining us today. It's been an honor. Thank you, JR, very much. And uh, we'll provide the links to the book uh, and getting purchasing the book. And we'll also put up the grandoldpartisan.com uh, blog, which is an outstanding source for information. And we are uh, very proud of our Republican Party. And uh, if you're a Republican, you need to learn that heritage, as Michael said, and also promote uh, the Republican Party. The more we know about the, the past of our party, uh, the more endangered the future for the Democratic Party becomes. So there's right. my paraphrase on your, on your great uh, remark there, sure. Michael. Thank you so much. I thank the audience for joining us. Please like and share this video. Um, media media wide and uh, make sure more people hear about this great education and uh, really it's uh, it's an encouragement and it gets us it gets me personally it gets me very very enthused about our future now that we're, uh, we're doing this deep dive in your book michael thank you thank you and let's and let's remember as we finish all of our shows remember what lincoln said michael he said liberty for all thank you and good night bye